What's up? This is Hoppy Hour. I am your host, Ryan Hoppy. And back on the show from the Fred and Angie Morning Show on 103.5 Kiss FM in Chicago, Fred is back on Hoppy Hour. What's up, dude? Am I the only one that says yes to this, or um, am I the only one who has time to do it, or what? what's the deal? I think it's a mix of both. You're <laughs> one of my highest listened to shows because you have a lot of fans in Chicago, but also you act at least like you want to be here. Some guests are just kind of, I can tell they're like, they have the eyes at the back of their head during the interview. Like they don't want to do it, but it's just kind of like a case of, they feel bad for me. But like when I have you on, I can actually tell that you sort of want to be on. You are, you are radio's best friend, man. You, uh, I've, I've known you for years and you've made this podcast into something. You won awards with this thing. You, you hustle. You've gotten fired from some jobs even, man. You, you're like a veteran almost. Yeah, dude, it's going on four years since my time on Rover Show. <laughs> yeah, man, you managed to screw that up, but that's all right because, uh, because you hustle. Look at you, man. You stay afloat. So I, I always have time for happy hour. I don't know if anybody cares what I have to say anymore after all these t- third time I think I've been on the show, but I'm, I'm here for you, man. Dude. You're killing a man, but what I love is it doesn't get to your head. I was thinking about you when I was driving in and just thinking about what I wanted to ask you. So I had a lot of free time in traffic. And so you're doing real well. Like all my friends listen to you and I'm not just saying that you're doing really well. You have a cast with you. Your show is bigger than ever. But what I like is even when you tease your cast, you're not demeaning towards Rufio or towards Angie. Like it's, your show, but you do a very good job of like making fun of them, but like not in like a very mean way. Like I can tell you like working with everybody on your show. Yeah. Well, I hope, I hope we all kind of pick on each other and it's all, it's all with love in mind. And, and obviously it's a team effort, you know, it shows it's definitely grown and it's because of all those folks that, that you hear and, and yeah, no, we have a good time and we disagree. You know, we don't, we don't all uh, see eye to eye by any means. I think that's what makes it interesting is that we genuinely are very, very different people, but uh, it's a lot of fun to work with people uh, who challenge you and challenge your opinions and uh, you know, who you can, you can, uh, you can have a good time with and pick at sometimes. And, and, you know, they know, they know where it's coming from. So when I was on Rover show, basically and he was so good at this. When you go to break, he would just go on his phone, play Angry Birds, and eat peanuts. And he didn't talk to anybody, but it's because he wanted to leave everything on air. He would say, I would come in there and pitch a bit, and Rover would be like, no, 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 save it for the air. Everything was about saving it for the air. For you guys, do you guys talk a lot during the commercial breaks or during a song, or do you guys try to save it for the air? It's a little bit of both, but yeah, you're right. Sometimes... Uh, we'll start talking about something that we weren't even intending to, to talk to uh, talk about on the show. And then it's like, wait a minute, hold on, you know, wait, just wait till the song's over or the commercials or whatever, because this is better than whatever we were just about to do that we had planned. So I don't think it's that disciplined. I think that's probably pretty smart of him, but at the same time, uh, we definitely, that it happens where it's like, wait a minute, you know, this debate that we're having or this conversation, this is that just came up organically. This is a lot more funny than funnier than whatever we were going to talk about. What would you say has been the biggest change for you over the last year on your show? Well, we've added a bunch of people. Uh, you know, for a long time, the first seven years or so, it was just it was just uh, Angie and me. And, you know, we've in a very short period of time added Kaylin and Rufio and Paulina. And, you know, Joffrey's kind of always been there, but, but he's, he's a bigger, has, you know, he, he's involved too with a lot of the segments. And so it's kind of just been trying to figure out how to do that, you know, and include a lot more voices and, and not talk all over each other and, and, you know, get the most out of everybody. That's been the biggest change. So when you have an agent, do you go to him for advice? Would you say that Paul Anderson has been a mentor to you? Yeah, Paul's been a mentor to me for sure. And, you know, he, he advises me, of course, on business. Um, you know, I'll talk to him about personal stuff sometimes. You know, he's, he's a friend. He's a mentor. I like Paul a lot. We have a great relationship. I don't know that our relationship is the same um, as it would be with every one of his clients. I mean, I think sometimes people, you know, if you ever watch that show Entourage, I think people think that if you sign an agent that, you know, that that's what it's like. And it, it's not, you know, ultimately that person's there 
uh, to provide you with business advice and to get you the best possible con- contractual arrangement or professional arrangement. But it just so happens that he and I are friends and, and we talk uh, an awful lot. So what got you into flying? Cause I know you're really into that. Yeah. My, my grandfather, uh, you know, he was in the radio business, but he flew, he was a, a private pilot. Uh, uh, my dad was a pilot as well. So it was sort of just, I wanted to be one ever since I was a, a little kid. It was, I wanted to follow in their footsteps and I wanted to learn how to fly. So when I, uh, on my, I guess I was 18 when I got my license. What's that like when you first fly and you don't have a person next to you and it's just you, the airplane and the air, what's that yeah. like? <laughs> Yeah, that's, um, that's, I'll never forget that. Actually. I, I remember it vividly that when that happened and when the instructor got out and when it was time for me to solo, it's, uh, that's, you know, I, I it's hard to describe it. Obviously you think, wow, this is all on me now. There's nobody here to save me. Uh, no one's gonna, you know, you do something stupid or you make a mistake. No one's going to jump on the controls and fix it, but it's pretty liberating when it's over. And it continues to be, uh, the most liberating thing that I do, uh, being able to, you know, the, the freedom is immeasurable being able to say, I'm going to go this place or whatever and jump in the airplane and then, you know, be able to, to, to fly there yourself. And it's, uh, it's an incredible feeling and it's very, very rewarding. And, and to be able to do the stuff with pilots and paws and fly the rescue dogs around, that just makes it even better. It combines two of my most favorite things. So when I'm driving a lot, And I know driving isn't the same as flying, but when I'm driving a lot, there's times if I'm just going down a road for 20 miles, like if it's like Indiana, my mind spaces out and then I have to go, okay, I'm driving focus. Do you ever have that when you're flying or are you a pretty organized guy where you're just able to focus? Well, I think both, you know, you get into, into cruise and you're, you're between one place and the other. And you know, it's not constant, I mean, you're, you're obviously always monitoring to make sure nothing's going wrong, you know, that the engine is doing what it's supposed to do and all the systems are doing what they're supposed to do. But at some point, you know, when you're just between point A and point B, you're kind of just, it's it's a very similar thing. You know, it's like when you're on the road and you're driving your car and you're, you're, you're not really, you know, your, your foot's not really moving because you're going at a certain speed and you're, you're not really moving the wheel because you're driving, you know, straight or whatever. There's not a whole lot to do. So it's easy to look out the window and have your mind wander. You just have to remember every few seconds that, uh, you need to know, you also need to know what's going on. So who from your show have you brought up in the plane? If any, Angie has been up there. Um, Kaylin has been up there. Uh, my old producer MJ had been up and I think that's it. I think that's it. What were they like? Were they nervous or did they have trust in you? Angie was, I, Angie, I think, trusted. I think anyone who's going to get in that thing trusts me to a certain extent. But Angie was nervous. She admitted that she was nervous. She was. She had a bottle of, bottle of Fireball in the back, and she was sipping on that. There's a picture on social media of that somewhere. But uh, she had to get someplace, and it was quicker for me to take her. So uh, I, she did fine, though. Kaylin, Kaylin, she doesn't seem to care. She uh, she likes it. It's uh, Angie was probably more nervous than anybody. So I was thinking about Angie too. It seems like she's the type of person, like I was saying to you off air, when you're with the five people you're with the most, it rubs off on you. So if you're with losers, you're a loser. But if you're with people that do well in life, you're going to do well in life. I feel like working with Angie would make you better at radio just because she's so good at it and she's been doing it for so long. I feel like you can learn things from just watching her do the show. I think that you, first of all, I think that you should make a motivational poster and sell it with the happy hour logo that says, if you hang with losers, you're a loser. (laughs) Uh, That's the first thought I have. The second thought is you're, you're absolutely right. Angie's, if she's, if if she's not the best female talent in the, in the business right now, then she's, she's one of the top two or three. and, And that's, that's for sure. But she definitely has made me better, uh, because she's really, really good. I hope I've done the same for her, but, uh, I know we've grown together and the show has grown tremendously. And when we started, I, we inherited kind of a bad situation, you know, kind of an absent host and very talented guy, but somebody who, you know, just for various reasons, it wasn't going well. And, and the ratings were really poor. And, uh, you know, the, we, we together and as a team, we built it back up. And there's no question that I am better 
uh, because of her and because of a lot of a lot of different reasons. But you know, this this market, Chicago, will make you better fast because you really you can't blow uh, or you'll get fired. Dude, how nerve wracking was it like eight, nine years ago when you first came here? Because I remember I was like in ninth grade and I was just reading the radio news like the geek I am. And I never heard of you. And I remember the media was making a big deal about how you're coming from North Carolina. Did that bother you to a point or did it motivate you? Oh, it motivated me for sure. You know, I know, I know that this, that Chicago is a town that, um, that while I, I've found them, everyone here welcoming, and I consider myself a Chicago now and, and one of them, I also know they're very proud and, and don't necessarily take kindly to people, especially in the media, uh, from outside of the market. I feel like this market uh, tends to give people home cooking and, and likes to support their own, and I understand that and I respect that. So I knew that I, I had to earn my place, and I'm still earning my place. I mean, it's, it's still a process. But the interesting thing is every job I've had – I've had four jobs, I guess, Dallas, Austin, Charlotte, and then Chicago. And every time I had nothing to lose, every single time, it was like I was in college and they put me on the radio in Dallas and I thought, I don't belong here. I'm certainly not good enough. I was God awful terrible. But, you know, the worst thing that could happen to me was that I would get fired. I mean, that was the worst, or that, you know, they would, they would fire me or that I, whatever, that I wouldn't put me on the air anymore. That was the worst thing that happened. Austin was the same way. It was like, if this doesn't work, I you know I go do something else. I guess in Charlotte, everyone counted me out. I mean, it was a big it was a big show in that market that had been winning consistently for a decade, and no one had gotten close to them in our demo. And so I figure if it doesn't work, I go back to what I was doing before, you know. And and we managed to make that work. And Chicago was no different. It was like, you know, what I was I, my biggest concern was losing the opportunity. I didn't want to do a bad job or or for it not to work. And then I knew that I, I had a shot at Chicago and I didn't, I didn't succeed, you know? So to answer your question, I, I don't remember being nervous because I just don't remember thinking that, um, what was the worst that happens? You know, the worst that happens is it doesn't work. The best that happens is that we're successful. And fortunately thus far we have been. So in the beginning of that answer, you said that you weren't very good in like Dallas. What were you doing that makes you think that you weren't good? Well, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, you know, I did a, I got that job because I was doing a college radio show that on a radio station that didn't even have a transmitter. It didn't broadcast anywhere. But the people at that radio station in Dallas, they didn't know that. Um, they'd heard my tape, and that was fake. I mean, it was basically a fake tape. I, I made it in a production room. I just did breaks over and over again until I thought I thought they sounded good, um, and they hired me and put me on in the middle of the night, and they had no idea that I'd never done it before. And so I just had to, I had to, you know, the guys like Billy the Kid, uh, he was at that station at the time. Uh, There's just so many folks who I just began to emulate and in the beginning try and sound like them, which is, you know, as a mistake, you know, you, you obviously you want to develop your own brand and your own thing. But at the time I thought if I could, if I could impersonate some of the guys I thought were really, really good, well, then I'm that much closer. And so I think I spent the first half of my career trying to sound like somebody else. And it wasn't until... Until maybe, maybe late in the game in Charlotte or when I got here that I decided, you know, I'm not anybody else. I'm only me, and I can only sustain what's real, what what comes out of my mouth, but because it comes out of my brain and the way that it sounds. And um, and so I think there was a transition that happened, and uh, I stopped trying to sound like guys who I emulate, you know, who I who I who were my mentors, who were my idols, you know, and and stopped trying to emulate them. It's really weird because I feel like you listened to a good amount of radio, at least back then, because you were sort of trying to be like them. I'm the same way. I don't listen to as much radio, but isn't it weird when you go on air and then you listen to it afterwards and you go, man, that sounds a little bit like this person that I've been listening to a lot. I don't know if that happens to you, but that happens to me where I'll be like, man, it's me being me, but you can hear that you've been influenced by the show that you've been listening to recently. No question. I mean, you know, Elvis Duran, um, first and foremost, uh, Howard, Elvis. Um, there was a show, a couple of shows in Phoenix uh, that I listened to growing up, you know, and I, I think that my game is an incorporation of all those people. You know, I, I would never ever say that I'm reinventing the radio business or the or the wheel. You know, it's it's not that. It's I think that 
it's my personality combined with a bunch of folks who I grew up listening to and respected and liked and who sound, you know, sort of shaped what I've become. And I'm grateful for all of that. And, and the, I don't, I don't want to try and be like anybody else. You know, I, I listen to Stern to this day, almost every day, and I don't, I'm not trying to sound like him, but to, to not try and sort of emulate his interview style or the preparation or the, or the, um, the ad, ad lib ability or the improvisational ability to not try and strive to, to get to that level. I mean, that would be stupid. What is the best part about him? To me, everybody talks about his interviews and yeah, they're really good. But to me, my favorite part is when the opening song comes up, it pumps me up every time. And then just not knowing how he's going to begin the show. And then it's almost like a version of late night TV, but it's radio where it's just like an opening monologue. And it's really entertaining because everybody talks about the interviews or the bits. I love the first 45 to 50 minutes of the show where he just recaps everything because I usually agree with everything he says. I've heard you say that before. I've heard you say how much you like that. The intro. I like the intro too. I I do think his interviewing style and, and, his approach is the best in the world. I mean, I don't think there's anybody who's a better interviewer because he's clearly so prepared, but he has this ability to make everybody shine. I mean, I'll hear him interview people who I do not like. And at the end of the interview, I like them. You know, I'm not an Adam Sandler fan. I listened to the entire interview he did. I think it was last November or December. And by the end of it, I liked Adam Sandler because he just has this way of extracting the information in such a what sounds to me to be a genuine and organic way. And he may be full of shit. I don't, I don't know. Maybe he doesn't um, really care, but um, I listen to that. And I think about that versus the way that I've been doing interviews for almost 20 years. And, you know, it's, it, he just has this way of bringing out, you know, making people feel comfortable and extracting things from them that you're not going to get by asking cheesy questions, of, you know, from something that you researched on Wikipedia or their website or something. You know, what's weird. I don't like Cardi B's music very much. I think it's okay. It's growing on me. At the time that he interviewed her back in May, I was not a fan of her at all. But after that interview, man, I'm the biggest fan of her now. He brought so much out of Cardi B that ever since then, he made me a fan of her. Like during the whole Nicki Minaj thing last week, I'm on Team Cardi. Like he made me a fan of her. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. You know, I I think a lot of artists... They come into interviews now. They're bored already. They they expect to be answering the same questions. They or they expect some sort of gotcha, you know, where the jock or the interviewer is going to try and and get that viral moment out of them that you know that will wind up on TMZ and and obviously you know catapult so and so's career in in whatever city. And I, so I feel like there's this jadedness that comes into artist interviews and celebrity interviews right now. But he has the Stern has this disarming way. And he's Howard Stern. I think everybody knows, you know, he is iconic in his own right. But I think he has this way of of sort of comforting these these people and then getting them to say things or extracting from them things that they wouldn't tell most people. or They wouldn't normally want to talk about because he he ingratiates, uh, you know, himself. So this is going to sound really weird, but I feel like a lot of people that maybe work in a small market, like not even top 100 Their whole goal is they want to be like, let's say, any of these radio guys we've just been talking about, and they never get their big break, but you've had your big break. What's that like? Because a lot of people would die to be in your position, and a lot of people would die to be like Elvis Duran or all the names that come from iHeartMedia and all the different companies. How does it feel that you've basically made it in Chicago. I know you're going to say, no, I haven't made it, but you've been there a decade and you're basically a huge name amongst kids that I know. How does that feel that you've basically done the impossible? Well, and you're right. I am going to say I haven't made it because I I truly believe that the second that, first of all, there's a lot left for us to do. Um, I mean, we, we do, we do well, but there's a lot more for us to do. We could do, we could do better. We could do even better and grow even more, um, and do an even better show. And I believe that we will, but, um, I do not believe that I've made it. And as soon as I believe that I've made it, I should probably quit doing this because I feel like at that point it it doesn't mean as much to me anymore. And I may not work as hard at it. So I will disagree with you there, but what I can tell you is you're right. You know, as I guess I always thought like coming up in the industry that, 
L.A., New York, Chicago. If you make it to one of those and you can hang on for a period of time, then then you that's it. That's the thing. Like that's the best that there is. And I, I in some regards that's true. Um, but I, what I can also say is, having lived in Charlotte, for example, I you know that's considered a large media market. I guess I think they're in the the high, low twenties, something like that. I could have made a whole career there. I love that city. I love living there. I love the quality of life. I love the home cooking. I love, I love the way that they treated people in the media. And what I would tell people is that, you know, if you, wherever you are, if you're able to, to, to develop a brand and develop a name for yourself and you're comfortable and you're happy, then I don't know that necessarily looking up is always the right thing to do. I'm I'm grateful that this happened, and I'm grateful that I get to call Chicago home, hopefully for a long time. But you know, in retrospect, if I if I had stayed in Austin or Charlotte or wherever, um, yeah, I probably always would have wondered, you know, what's what's New York like, what's LA like, or what's Chicago like. But I also can tell you that um, the folks who I know who did stay are living great lives, and they're having lots of success, and they're naming their future to a certain extent, and they don't have to come here to prove themselves. I like those radio guys. You see a lot of them at the morning show boot camp because the morning show boot camp is a mix of the major market names. And then it's people that are happy to be in the small markets and making a living and being names there. And then there's people that will be like, yeah, you know, I'm number one in Des Moines. It's okay. And they have like no passion about it. And to me, that rubs me the wrong way is when a person isn't happy with what they have. You know what I'm saying? No, I agree. And I think, I think people, when I was in a media market or smaller market, I guess I figured, well, if I can get to a big market, then I'll make so much more money and I'll, people will know who I am and I'll have more resources and get more interviews and that, you know, the, the studio will be cooler and taller building. And a lot of those things are true. But then again, a lot of the things are exactly the same. Um, you know, we have the same struggles here, relatively speaking, uh, the same competitiveness. It's the same equipment uh, that I left in the last market that I was in that was smaller. It's, you know, it's the same frustrations, you know, the same desires. It's just, it's all relative. And I, I really mean it when I like try, it's easy for me to say, I know that and I'm, I don't ever want it to change, but I can tell you that, um, knowing what I know now, I would tell those who are having a great run wherever they are, if you're happy with that and you feel like you're succeeding, then don't, don't not aspire for more, but maybe don't discount, you know, the kind of career that you could have uh, for a very, very long time in wherever you are. So, I'm a very hyper nervous guy. Like I overthink everything. So when I do give my own show, what's the advice you can give me or maybe a show that's not doing well right now on how to do well in the ratings? I mean, I think everyone says be authentic and those sorts of things. And, and that's true. I mean, that's the obvious answer is be, be who you are. And, uh, you know, I feel like people, they, they want, they want, to have that companion. I mean, that's what we're doing ultimately is, yeah, we're creating content and playing songs and commercials or whatever else. But I mean, you know, we're, we're ultimately companions in Chicago. We're companions to people in their car and traffic. And, and I think ultimately uh, if you're a likable person and a relatable person and you're willing to share and you're willing to be yourself, I mean, you have to be entertaining. You have to, you have to do many things. Well, I mean, it's not that simple, but at the same time, um, I know there are guys out there who aren't as slick on the radio or as smooth or as good at talking up songs or whatever, you know, as the radio type things as, and then there are guys out there who are just super conversational and relatable. And I think those are the guys who win. And so I think, you know, I, I guess I come back to that cliche answer, which is, yeah, you have to be entertaining and you have to be compelling and you have to be informative, but you got to do it in a way that makes people think, I like that guy or I relate to that guy or I hate that guy, but I definitely want to hear what he or she has to say. So five years ago, I was all about, I listened to Opie and Anthony. I listened to Opie and Anthony. That was all I listened to. But over the years, I've realized that being a shock jock can work at times if you have some of their tendencies, but to do a whole show about it isn't cool. And you know who I've really been getting into? is Mojo. I don't know what it is. Well, obviously he does real well in Michigan, but man, 
if I could be Mojo in life, dude, that'd be awesome. He was so cool to me at the morning show boot camp. And to me, he's an example of a guy who made it in a great market. Yeah, there's a perfect example. I mean, Mojo is not only a, one of my closest friends, but he's also a mentor. Uh, he's an example. You know, there's a guy who made a tremendous career for almost 20 years in Detroit, big market, great city. Um, you know, and he, he had plenty of opportunities to be syndicated and to go to, you know, come back to Chicago. I know he could have been here and a lot of other places, but um, for Mojo, you know, he's, he's doing so well. He's a name brand. He's a, he's practically the mayor of that city. I've been, you know, it, it, we can't go anywhere in Detroit where people don't say Mojo, Mojo, Mojo. And, you know, that just, be, and we're talking multiple generations, you know, we're talking to the, the power of his brand. And on top of that, he's, he's just a great person. And uh, I, I would agree with you that that's, you know, there's a guy that you should look at as an example. He's, um, he's one of the best. So I was with Menace. I was with Randy from the Woody show and I was with Mojo and we were getting coffee on the first floor where the morning show boot camp was at. And it wasn't even like he was teaching us about radio, but just listening to him off air, everything the guy says, the way he speaks and he has confidence where he's not cocky, but he's very confident. It kind of rubs off on you. Yeah, I, I, I can't say enough good things about about Mojo, and and he gets it. You know, he understands. The other thing about about radio is it's a business. You know, and I think people sometimes the talent talent. You know, and I say that with the air quotes. Forget about that. I mean, yeah, we have a a voice and we have a platform, and the product is about us. But at the same time ultimately people are advertising with us. They're spending money that these people, these clients, you know, these are, these are essential. They're the backbone of what we're doing. We can't do it without them. And, and here's a guy who he gets that and he, he's able to, you know, um, get himself in with the clients and the buyers and the decision makers. And, you know, he, this is the business on and off the air. And, and uh, you know, he's a genuine person in both respects. And that's something else that I, I would encourage people to remember. Uh, it took me a long time to understand that, you know, that this is the business of Fred, it's the business of Fred and Angie, it's the business of our show. And, you know, ratings are one thing, but, but, you know, being accessible off the air to sales, to our clients, to our partners, to, to um, organizations throughout the city that are important, philanthropic organizations. I mean, this, all of this stuff counts. And, and it's, all of that stuff is what makes us invaluable as things change. You know, yeah, people say, oh, well, you know, what about Pandora? What about satellite? Aren't you worried about that? And the answer to that question is not really, because hopefully the efforts that I'm making and the guys like Mojo are making and a lot of guys across the country to make themselves these invaluable members of, of their communities, hopefully that transcends whatever, however people hear it and however people use it, whether it's a podcast or whether it's an app or whatever's going to come out in 10 years that we don't even know about. Hopefully, you know, if you're doing all the right things like Mojo does, for example, then, then, then you'll, you'll adapt. Is it weird to have your own billboard multiple times? Like, do you ever drive down the road and you see your face? Uh, yeah, I do. And it is a little weird. I'm super grateful because not a lot of shows get billboards anymore. Not a lot of shows get marketing at all. So I think it's cool. Um, it is a little weird, but I, I suppose uh, it comes with the territory, I guess. But but yeah, it's it's strange. What do you do? Because I overthink a lot of things, and I feel like at times I just need to turn radio off. What is the key to not being on social media all the time and not just thinking about radio? Because we get so wrapped up into it. How do you just turn it off for a while? Yeah, I have a hard time with that. I'm like you. I, I have anxiety. I, uh, I have to force myself to, to focus on other things. I tend to ruminate, you know, if somebody says something mean, uh, about the show or about me yeah. or misunderstand something that I said and on an email or a tweet or whatever, I tend to sort of uh, fester on that a little bit. Uh, I, I've got, I've had to get better about it. I mean, I go to therapy and I, I try and be mindful about, about, uh, you know, how important that is. I mean, no, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings or upset them, but not everybody necessarily understood what you said or, or heard it the right way or took it the right way or, or whatever. And you, you, obviously you can't control the way that people interpret different things that you do. You can only really, I suppose, remind yourself of what your intent was. And so it's been a struggle though. I mean, social media is not always a good place for me. Um, and I tend to, 
I tend to sort of hyper focus on on that. And it's it's. Uh, I wish I had a, a a definitive piece of advice for you on on how to separate yourself from that. But I think I'm guilty of the same thing. You know, you you put something on Twitter and you want people to like it or think it's funny. You know, you put a picture up and you want people to like it and acknowledge it. And I think. You know, it's it's a process of trying to remind yourself that that stuff is pretty vapid. And while it's important for your brand, and it certainly is an indicator of, of of you know, I suppose the power of of the brand or the support that you have or you're following or what you're doing. I you know, at the end of the day, it's not it's not always real life. Are you the type of guy where? Because this is me, I'll say to myself when I wake up in the morning, I go, "This is the day." I'm not going to be on social media as much. Then I go to the kitchen. I pour a glass of orange juice. Then I'm immediately on Twitter. That's me. Every yeah, day. That's, that's the struggle, man, is that like, I can tell you if I didn't do what I did, if I were, I don't know, a lawyer or a doctor or something, I don't honestly even think I'd be on it. I don't think I would, I don't think I would expect anyone to care what I think or what I'm doing. In fact, to this day, I don't necessarily always understand why anybody cares. I'm grateful that they do. And it gives me an opportunity to try out content and to, to see other people's content. And, you know, I really use it as an information source. You know, I follow most of what I follow are other news sources or other shows or other people I respect. I'm not really using it um, to necessarily communicate as much as I am. But, but the other thing is it's a tool. You know, the listeners and, and those who are consuming our content have access to us all the time. And, and I think, if, you know, if, if you're active on it, um, then it's an advantage, but that, that makes it more part of the job. So I think that's where I get in trouble is I could probably not look at it and be okay. But truthfully, I think the expectation is that we are going to be involved in our job on social and that we are going to be accessible and that we're going to respond and we're going to be posting content. And so, uh, that's, I think that's where it gets tricky is you, you kind of, it, it's part of the gig. So for people that are in the windy city and can tune into one Oh three, five, or for people that are not in Illinois and can't tune in, but could listen via the iHeartRadio app, why should they check out Fred and Angie? Well, because I'm I'm absolutely hysterical, and oh, yeah. um, I'm I'm really really funny, and I'm I'm really intelligent, and uh, I'm very good looking, and those are all the reasons why I would say that you should listen. Uh, in actuality, I, I, I look. We're, we're a bunch of folks on the show that are, we're friends, we're, sometimes we're enemies, we have differing opinions, I think we represent so much of, you know, we, we've got young, we've got, you know, a, a little bit older, we've got moms and, and, and aspiring parents and, and different political views, I think we just represent a cross-section and we talk about hopefully stuff that's on everybody's mind every day in Chicago and, and offer our own uh, perspective and our own, our own take on it. So that's why I think people should listen because... Uh, hopefully when you listen, you feel like you've got, you know, some new friends or, or I don't know, some, some new people with whom you differ and, and, you know, want to, want to strangle or whatever it is. Uh, hopefully it's something either for you to laugh or smile or think about. That's what we're after. Long answer. So dude, keep up the good work. I listen when I can. You're on the list of like five to six shows that I listen to about five years ago. I had about 20 shows that I listened to, but I also wasn't really working in radio. I was living at home, but now you're one of the six shows I check out and it just makes me feel like I'm back home. Cause I would listen to you when I was driving to class for the 10 minute drive I had in the 7 AM hour. So it's kind of like a throwback thing. Like the first thing I did, and I'm not just saying this cause we're friends and cause you're on my show. But the first thing I did, Six weeks ago, when I went to the morning show boot camp and I first flew into Chicago when I was at the airport, it was like 9 a.m. I went right to your show. It just makes me feel at home. Well, I got to tell you, you know, you're an aficionado. You study the business. You listen to a lot of shows. And I mean this. Uh, it, it means a lot to me that, that we would be on your list because I know that you uh, you spend a lot of time with this stuff and you network and you know a lot of guys. And, and uh, so I appreciate that. That means a lot to me. Thank you. I would say the biggest thing, because you just basically gave me a nice uh, compliment that just made my ego feel good. <laughs> what I would say is what I like most about you, like I said, is you treat everybody well. And it just really rubs off well because there's a lot of really good shows out there. But what I hear is 
the crew doesn't like being there. The host is great. That's not like it is here at the bone. Like everybody is great at the bone. Everybody's good on your show. But what I'm saying is nothing is worse than when you can kind of hear the drama within a few lines that are set on air. It's very uncomfortable. Well, I appreciate it. I, you know, I'm sure there's some people out there who, who, uh, who could argue with that about me, but I ultimately, I hope more, more than not people think that I'm a decent human being and uh, not too much of a jackass and, and, you know, you're not always going to get along. Angie and I don't always get along. I don't always get along with everybody on our show. And I think that's part of the reason why it works, because we genuinely differ. And we're it's like any other uh, group of friends or family. You know, sometimes they get on your nerves and, and you roll through it and you keep going. And uh, and so, I, you know, like I said, I, I hope that I hope more people have a good experience with me than not. And and that's all I can really ask for. Well, dude. Thanks for being on the show. It's been a lot of fun, and keep up the good work. Thank you, Hoppy. You as well. I appreciate you. This has been Hoppy Hour. I am your host, Ryan Hoppy, signing off. Happy Hour. Happy Hour.